Hi. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out. It is such an honor for me to talk to one of my heroes in the world of food and food policy, Mark Bittman. So let's get things started. Mark, your new book. Why did you write it? How is it different from all your previous books? <laughs> was, that, was that what we were just discussing, how this was going to start? Um, so my new book is How to Cook Everything Fast. And I wrote it to address, I wrote it for a bunch of reasons, and I'm very happy about it for a bunch of reasons. I wrote it in part to take away the two main excuses that people use to not cook. One is that everybody says, um, I don't have enough time, and the other is that many people say, I'm scared, or I don't know how to cook, I don't know how to do it. So we tried, I was working with a team of two designers, um, I was working with a team of one designer, and then another designer butted in, but that was a good thing. <laughs> and then, um, and two editors, and two cookbook writer, recipe tester, recipe writer people, and me. And um, we said, how can we write recipes in a way that's really different? I mean, how, how can we not only make things faster, which is actually a lot of stuff about making recipes faster is kind of common sense, like you have clean surfaces and you have a bowl or a plastic bag you can throw trash in so you're not always opening the garbage can and you grate things instead of chopping them so that they cook much more quickly and you preheat stuff. And I mean, it's just like there's a million different tricks and they're all in the book. The book is great. I mean, I'm very happy about this. No, the book is real. I'm very happy about this. There book. may be some copies outside. Yeah, I'm very happy about this book. You can buy it or not. I'm really happy about it. Um, but I was, but, I, but there was a, in a way it was the most intellectual book or certainly most intellectual cookbook I've ever written because there was this challenge of how do we write recipes differently and those of you who cook know that every recipe looks pretty much the same which is a box like this which is an ingredient list and then a bunch of directions and the problem is the ingredient list says half a cup chopped onion, a tablespoon of minced garlic, sliced tomato, chopped chicken, whatever it is. And that came from people who had other people working for them because they would say, bring me a half a cup, bring me some chopped onion, bring me some garlic, mm. bring me some tomato. Those are called chefs. We are not chefs, we are cooks. Cooks work by themselves or maybe you have one helper. Um, so the problem with the ingredient list is that people who take this stuff literally and are measuring a half a teaspoon of cinnamon before they start cooking, which people do, people who follow recipes slavishly do this, would spend 20 minutes getting the ingredients ready for a recipe that really could be done in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we said, how do we eliminate that? And we came up with this, and this, you'll see this immediately when you look at the book, we came up with this conceit, which is two colors, black and blue. Um, and one color is for cooking and one color is for prep. So instead of doing all of this stuff first and then following the directions. Meanwhile, the, 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 uh, sorry, meanwhile is exactly the word I didn't want to use. The most popular word in many cookbooks is meanwhile, because <laughs> that was like some kind of tick, right? So step one says, saute the onion in olive oil, uh, brown the chicken, da da da. Step two says, meanwhile, <laughs> But you're like, wait, I was just doing all of that stuff. I didn't see the meanwhile part. But we, so we actually swore that we were never going to use the word meanwhile in this book. So, so it's the, it's the non-meanwhile cookbook and it works. Maybe that's enough about that. You'll look at it, you'll like it and you'll either buy it or you won't. So it's as good. I could talk more about it, but you know, that was five minutes already. No, so. that's fine. So it's as good as how to cook everything, but you put all these great tips and techniques in that will help you get through it more I'm quickly. not gonna denigrate, I'm never gonna denigrate how to cook everything. But, as good uh, as I said. Yeah, but I mean, the how to cook, first of all, every book you write represents where you're at in life at that particular time. So I mean, cookbooks may not be novels, they may not be literature, they may, they may be in a self-help books or whatever they are, how-to books. Um, but they still, I'm a different person than I was. I wrote How to Cook Everything when I was in my 40s, I'm in my 60s. I am a completely different person and the book shows that. How to Cook Everything is like, here's everything I could think of that you need to know in order to cook lots and lots of stuff. This really is streamlined cooking for today, updated ingredients, this whole new recipe thing. Um, and I will say one tiny plug is that you could, I could deliver a, 
How to Cook Everything Fast book, a book with a thousand, or this is actually 2,000 recipes in six months, if I just took existing fast recipes right. and put them all together. I mean, every fish recipe is fast. So yeah. you just do a fish <laughs> book and you have fast recipes. cooking. So vegetables are very fast. So you just do vegetables, it's fast. But what was good about this is we really tried to take things apart, put them back together in smart and quick and interesting ways. And I, like I said, it's, it was a very challenging, um, thoughtfully done book. I think it shows. It's doing well. People like it. I'm happy about it. Fantastic. It's an easy and thing to say nice things about. I'm not up here apologizing for, for it. It's for sale after the program. Now, you say you're in your 60s. You look fantastic. You do not look like you're in your 60s. And part, yeah, let's give a round of applause. Oh, we can do this when I'm in my 80s. <laughs> we'll come and, back and do it then. But part of it is because you have changed your lifestyle and how you eat in, in uh, recent or years. Or because I have good genes. I don't know. Yeah, genes definitely factor into it. Can you talk about this vegan? Before Six Plan, which was another one of your books? It's true. People didn't tell me I looked so great 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> and my, my ex-wife told me at one point that I looked kind of chubby. I remember. It was not a good <laughs> not day. Nice. Um, ex -wife, yeah. Um, well, VB6, v some, of these, some of these questions are so it's not you, it's me, but some of these questions are so big, it's like, how do I not talk for 15 minutes in response to this question? So, because it's, this is a global thing. So 15 years ago, I think, I saw the writing on the wall that said, um, we are all going to eat more plants. This is, it's not, it wasn't a revelation, but I realized it, that's when I realized it. So I decided to write How to Cook Everything Vegetarian, not to really familiarize myself more with the plant kingdom. It wasn't to embrace my inner vegetarian, because there is no inner vegetarian. But, <laughs> um, but I wanted to know. And so I wrote that book. And by the time it was done, there was a UN report that said um, industrial production of livestock was responsible for, now I've forgotten the number they used, but 15%, say, of greenhouse gases. Um, it was. It was clear, you know, we were producing 9 billion animals a year in the United States, and there wasn't the land to do it, and there certainly isn't the land to do it if other people around the um, world are going to start eating meat like we did, and the whole hyper-processed food thing, and, and, you know, we'll get into this stuff. But it became clear that the more plants you ate, the better. And, and we were talking backstage, I said in the 80s, I wrote a little bit about nutrition, and I had to stop writing about nutrition because... I didn't think anyone knew what they were talking about, and guess what? They didn't. So it's not like I figured out what was smart. It took me as long to figure out what a good diet was as it took everybody else. But now we kind of know, and we know that a good diet means less junk food, um, more plants, probably fewer animal products for most of us. Um, but that fat's not bad the way we demonize yeah, it. Yeah, fats are not. Most fats are not. Trans fats are bad, but they're effectively illegal at this point. Yeah. So they're. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, fat's not bad. I mean, in moderate quantities. But I mean, you know, everything in moderate. It's all so, it's all so simple. It really is all so simple. But it wasn't always, and it wasn't always so clear. And so, eight so or maybe ten. six. So eight years ago, I was, seven years ago, I was 57, and um, all of this stuff was gelling in my head. And I went to this doctor that I'd gone to for a long time, and I, he used to call me the champion of blood work because all my blood work would come back. It was great. And he said, guess what? You're no longer the champion of blood work. Um, Everything has moved in the wrong direction. <laughs> this was when my ex-wife was calling me chubby since I was 40 pounds yeah. heavier than I am now. So um, he was a sort of ex-hippie, great guy, really a friend. And I said, what should I do? And he said, you should become a vegan. And I said, I'm not going to become a vegan. And that's not going to work. And he said, well, you're a smart guy. Figure something out. So <laughs> I, this is a true story. I put, all this, I put all this stuff in the blender, and I kind of came up with, well, the idea is not really to be a vegan. It's not even a very good word anyway, because we were saying backstage you could eat Oreos and French fries and Coke, and you could be a vegan. So <laughs> it's true also. So I thought, why not just force myself to eat more plant food, more unprocessed food, and then 
but not do that exclusively because that's too hard. So I invented this diet called Vegan Before Six where I eat only unprocessed food and only food from the plant kingdom until six o'clock at night and then I do whatever the hell I want to do. So, um, <laughs> and it works and I cheat. The first thing people say when I say this thing is, can I put milk in my coffee? And I say, of course you can put milk in your coffee. You can cheat as much as you want, but if you don't cheat very much, it's a very effective diet. It worked for me. Um, it's fairly principled. It's realistic. People can do it. You can still get to like drink wine and eat meat at night. And, and it, you know, the, I think that the whole you know, flexitarian, semi-vegan, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call a way of eating that emphasizes plants, that's the way of the future, which is essentially the realization I came to in 2000 or 2003 or whenever I decided to write How to Cook Everything Vegetarian. And the meat you do eat, you do try to be more conscious about it, try to find better quality meat. Yeah, except for when I eat like hot dogs, but yeah. <laughs> there are um, some hot dogs Yeah, 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 but meat. sometimes you're just in a weak place. Exactly. Um, <laughs> It's true. Or sometimes you're in Bloomington, Indiana, as I was the day before <laughs> yesterday. So, um, you know, I have a great, you know, I was in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, this is not a food, this is a road story. This is like an on the road with Mark story. I was in Bloomington, Indiana. Was anyone in this room in Bloomington the day before yesterday? I just want to make sure I'm not going to insult anyone personally. <laughs> So I was in Bloomington, Indiana, and this person, and I was going to Syracuse the next day, which was yesterday. I was in Syracuse this morning. And I said to them, I'm going to Syracuse tomorrow. And someone said, oh man, you're going to Syracuse? <laughs> and I said, you can say that sitting here in Bloomington, Indiana? Oh, come on, they've got those beautiful That was mean, stuff. wasn't it? Yeah, it was that mean. was really mean. I like Syracuse. I'm sorry. Well, I like Syracuse. They've got it's those great beautiful city. limestone buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Syracuse is really cool, no, too. Come about, on. Yeah. It right. was raining. It was 45 degrees. The leaves were all gone from the trees. You got Midwesterners here, man. <laughs> um, Syracuse is practically the Midwest anyway. Sorry. Okay, well, go. speaking of Syracuse, <laughs> so you, you said that in order to get better in touch with your food, you have seen like the death of some of the animals you've eaten and actually participated in. How did that make you feel? How did that change the way you feel about it's it? It's gross. I mean, killing animals yeah. is gross. I think that it's really psychologically hard. I think that people who work in slaughterhouses, like executioners, have problems. If you yeah. routinely kill other beings, you have problems. And I think, you know, if you've, if you've held a fish, even held a fish and killed it, um, you notice it, you feel that. If you've, if, you've been, if you've participated in killing a big animal, it's a big deal, it's not a joke. There's gallons of blood, or pints, let's say. Um, we don't have to exaggerate, it's bad enough. But we do, you know, there are people who won't boil lobsters. Okay, I get it, but why, why would you not boil a lobster, but it's fine to go to the supermarket and buy a package of pork, which is actually pig. You know, I mean, it's, really? <laughs> so, you know, I, there are people who won't eat oysters because they don't want to put a live thing in their mouth. But, you know, and all of these quirks are forgivable. I'm not, I don't have any rules about this stuff, but I think it's important to know, it's important to know where all your food comes from. And this is something I write about all the time. But meat, animal products, it's really a different, it's a different thing. It's different than a carrot. I mean, I think it's important to know where a carrot comes from, but it's, different when it's beef. I think it's important to understand that there's a sacrifice that goes into having it, that someone is killing it, even if you get it in the plastic bag, which is why I'm going out shooting in two days to prepare to become a deer hunter. That's a whole other story. Um, so you've gone from you know stuff that I've read for decades, it's all these delicious and wonderful recipes, to the world of food writing, uh, food policy writing. Um, how has that changed the way you look at food? Is it no longer delicious to you? Are you always thinking about sort of the bigger reverberations of it? Yeah. So no, it's it not no longer <laughs> delicious. It's still delicious. But I think if, if you believe that food is here for your pleasure and you don't think about anything else at this point, I think you're a very lucky person. I mean, I think you are. <laughs> I wouldn't mind being that person, but I am no longer that person. It's very hard for me to think about food as this thing that is just for my pleasure. I like that, and I still like to eat. Um, I like to eat a lot. But um, 
Food gives us an opportunity, the fact that, you know, the fact that there are this many people here in this room, the fact that people will come listen to a discussion like this means that food is giving us an opportunity to, to like climate change, really crack society wide open, really talk about big issues all the time, things that matter, ways in which we can change things for the better, um, why that's important, and I think to sort of hurry things up a little bit. And I think um, that's what I wanted to do when, when I started writing about, when I became an opinion writer, um, I was a little tired of recipe writing. I since have recovered in that regard, but... I'm but, glad that you're still doing uh, yeah, something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I never stopped really, but I, I thought it's, there's just too much out there to just be writing recipes. And I'm really good at writing recipes, and I like writing recipes, but I'm a you know, serviceable writer at least, and I had all of these things that I thought were not being addressed at the Times. Mm -hmm. They're still not being addressed at the Times by anyone but me, which is a kind of a responsibility at this point. And I think these things are important to address. And, you know, I'm... You didn't ask, but I mean, I'm quite <laughs> proud that I was the first person to be writing regularly food opinion stuff in a major paper in the United States. It's really a cool thing. So, I, yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't really asking for that, but I was really happy, I am really happy about that. Yeah. I was ecstatic about it in, in 2010 was it your when idea it started. Was, was my idea. So well, I walk, walk the Times is a very great, a really great place in many ways because you can say to people, I need to do some new stuff. I need, I have ideas. I need to refresh this. And it's not working the way I'm doing it. And they actually encouraged me. You know, Bill Keller, other editors, high up editors encouraged me to figure out how to make this thing work. And I did. It took a year to figure out how to make it work. And, um, yeah, I was really happy about it. That. I am really happy about it. I am so glad you did it, and I'm so glad it's in a paper like the Times covering food policy for the Chicago Tribune, which I did for many years. I often felt hamstrung, like, I've got to quote the pork producers, and then I quote yeah. the, you know, the tireless people who make no money, who are trying to stop antibiotic-resistant infections, as if they were completely equal. And I couldn't use any of my sort of judge, judgment as, these guys are totally lying, you know, or calling people out as much as I wanted right. to. And so. I'm so glad. I'm always cheering, silently cheering on your stuff. Well, one thing about... It's okay to talk about this another minute, right? Yeah, yeah. obviously. One thing about... Is it okay? Uh, yeah. You're interested in that. I hope you're interested in this, because I think it's really important. Traditional reporting is fabulous, obviously. But to think that the opinion pages, of at least the opinion pages of the Times, to think that it's just a bunch of people running, what is it called, running off at the mouth? Is that the expression? <laughs> um, just yeah. saying whatever they want to do no, this is, is really a mistake. Reported. We, yeah. we, uh, I, and, but also I know this is true of my colleagues, but we report stuff to death, and then we figure out what we actually think about it, and then we say that. So I feel like my only two responsibilities in writing my columns, and this is such a privilege, are one, get the facts straight, which, I mean, I maybe run two corrections a year, so that's not bad. And two, figure out what my opinion actually is so that I believe it and that I, I stand behind it, that I can make this argument that at least I believe. Um, and that's, that's the job, and it's really great. It's really cool. And if you don't fact check it, if you don't do the reporting advance, you're going to get killed out there. Right. So, well, I do know. a fact checker also. So that's why I have no corrections. If I didn't have a fact checker, I'd have <laughs> three corrections a week. But they'd be pretty minor, mostly. So we just had an election. And it's part of an election in a lot of states and counties. There are referenda and measures and propositions. And so we just saw two states have GMO, genetically modified food labeling laws. We saw uh, soda taxes and others. Um, we actually saw the very first soda tax in the United States passed in the Communist Republic of Berkeley, California. Where we're moving, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> So what, what do you make of that? Are dominoes going to fall? Is this just an isolated case? I wrote a lot about it. I've been a, um, a big advocate for soda taxes. I've written about them. Um, a friend of mine says too much. 
said you can't Never write you can't humor. write about this Berkeley thing next week. You just wrote about it three yeah. weeks ago. But I thought it was more important to write about Berkeley before the election and help the thing win than, than it is to report on it. It's being reported on. But for those, for those of you who don't know, there have been talk of soda taxes, even nationally. Obama mentioned it um, while he was running for president in 2008. Um, so to put a steep tax on soda to discourage its consumption and, and then also to use the money, if possible, for public health measures. So there were, it's, it failed narrowly in New York. It failed very narrowly in Philadelphia. It's failed in small cities around the country. Never got who've a tried. committee in Chicago. Right. So, so that's failing widely, I guess. <laughs> um, but then Berkeley put it on the ballot, and San Francisco put it on the ballot this year. In Berkeley, it passed by 75%, which is really incredible. And in San Francisco, it actually passed by 55%, but that was a failure because the way that measure was written, it needed two-thirds to pass. But a majority voted for it. So yes, I think where this is going to snowball, I think the fact that you can make the argument that the nation of Mexico instituted a soda tax January 1st, 2014, and that consumption of soda in Mexico will have fallen 10% by the end of this year as a direct result of that. Wow. And this is an interesting thing. Consumption of water in Mexico has increased 13% this year. Nice. So this is, a, this is, I mean, if you say 10% decrease in soda per year and 10% increase in consumption of water per year, that's a big public health step. It's huge. Um, so, I th yeah, I'm a big supporter of this. I think it's totally great, and I, I think next, next election day we're going to see some amazing stuff in the world of soda taxes. Okay, and we also saw some GMO labeling measures, and uh, so what do you think of this whole push to label GMOs? Is that the right way to go? Uh, well, actually, I think not. Um, it's funny. I think you would, you would assume I would say, I think you might assume that I'd say something different, but I think that... Um, I guess I think two major things about the GMO thing. One is that GMOs are a little bit of a red herring, and the food movement um, is spending an awful lot of energy on this labeling act. And I, you know, the people who are the people who are behind the labeling laws are friends of mine, or at least colleagues or people I respect. I think it's a mistake to put this much energy into it. I think we should be focusing more on. Um, antibiotics in, in animal production. I think we should be fo focusing more on uh, the marketing of junk food to children. I think we should be focusing on more on animal production in general. I think we should be focusing more on the effect of agriculture on climate change. All of these things, I think, are more important than GMOs. But the reason I actually like the labeling laws, having said all of that, is because I think they're a little bit of the thin end of the wedge, and that if you say, um, What's GMO labeling about? It's about transparency. Well, what, exactly what we need in food production is transparency. We need to know whether our animals were raised with antibiotics. We need to know how many and what kind of pesticides are on our vegetables. We need to know how our animals were raised in general. We need to know, we might want to know how labor is being treated in the raising of our food. There are many different things that, many different things that would be great to know, would be greater for more transparent in food production. GMOs is not the most important of those, but if transparency comes more to food labeling, we don't even know how much sugar is in the product. Right, we because buy. we don't know. I mean, we don't, you know, we could argue, we could argue that every product should say has added sugar. I mean, a friend of mine went out and bought Pico de Gallo the other day. Pico de Gallo is chopped tomatoes, onions, cilantro, cilantro and lime. lime. Maybe jalapeno. That's how you make Pico de Gallo. Went out and bought Pico de Gallo in a classy supermarket. I don't know if it was Whole Foods or Wegmans or what. And it had sugar in it. It's like, it's the last thing you need to put sugar what in. What the heck is that? Have you noticed, like, you can't even eat a salad dressing without it being sweet anymore? You never could, but the, you know... No, I make a vinaigrette without any salt in it. Without Rob, any sugar in Rob it. Rob Lustig, who's like the sugar... Whiz, at the University of says California, that, San Francisco, says that 80% of products in supermarkets have added sugar. So even if he's off by 20%, it means you, if, as far as I'm concerned, it means this is, I'm going to take 30 seconds and give you the summary of all my food, my eating advice. There's a, there's a spectrum of 
things that are called food. Two-thirds of that spectrum should not be called food. So you could call it non-food, you could call it unidentifiable food-like objects, you could call it poison for all I care because it's closer to definition to poison than food. So if you take this spectrum and you take two-thirds of it and you throw it out the window and you say, I'm going to eat Twizzlers every alternate Monday and I'm going to have a Coke every Wednesday or whatever, but for the most part I'm leaving that food behind, and you focus on what real food is, which we all, I think we all can agree what real food is, Whole and foods. in that real food, you focus on plants, because we all know we should be eating more plants than we were eating last year, and we could probably say the same thing next year. And then you do more cooking, you've solved almost every problem you have in food. It's there as simple go. as that. Sounds like you're ripping off your pal Michael Pollan. <laughs> Eat food. Um, so, sorry for two policy, food policy geeks to geek out here for a minute, but I was so impressed that you were one of the first people who took this controversial stance showing how hunger groups were often in cahoots with unhealthy big food in big food, in, uh, like um, food feeding programs. How does that work? How is it that, you know, Feeding America starts to advocate for unhealthy foods in the SNAP program or in the school lunch program or the school breakfast program? You know, I think we're put in the uncomfortable position of um, supporting a program that's not really that great, which is SNAP. Um, it's the formerly food stamp program. Yeah, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. Yeah. That's what you have to say every single time. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's not, it wasn't that well thought out, it's not that well administered, there's a lot of waste, et cetera, et cetera. But if someone's making so little money that they have trouble buying food, it's certainly easier to support SNAP than it is to say, okay, let's raise the minimum wage to $15, because that is not about to happen anytime soon. So um, you have to defend SNAP, I have to defend SNAP, we have to, but SNAP is so screwed up that although you can't buy a roast chicken, with SNAP dollars, you can buy a two-liter bottle of Pepsi with SNAP dollars. And candy which, bars and flaming yeah, hot Cheetos for dinner. Right, yeah. which to me is the equivalent of saying you could buy cigarettes with SNAP dollars, so, um, or close to it. So, uh, junk food companies love SNAP because people, are, we are subsidizing the purchase. We, who pay taxes, are subsidizing the purchase of junk food by people who are less fortunate who are getting food stamps. Um, so Pepsi loves food stamps. Um, and so then you get into, so Pepsi subsidizes, and there's some, there's some funding that goes from Pepsi to subsidize anti-hunger groups, and of course we're all in favor of anti-hunger groups, or at least we think we are, but then anti-hunger groups are so animately opposed to any threat to food stamps, which I kind of get that when you say, um, food stamps should not be used to buy, soda. to buy soda or candy, they say you're stigmatizing people who use food stamps. You're humiliating stamps. them. I right. said, is it more humiliating to not be able to buy a rotisserie chicken or not buy candy bars? Well, is it more humiliating to not buy candy bars or to get diabetes? I mean, at some point, what are we talking about? We have to make, you know, as a society, un until the Reagan, the Reagan er era really took hold, we as a society thought that we were able to make big decisions that affected all of us to protect ourselves from ourselves. And if you look at seatbelt laws or tobacco legislation or all those kinds of things, we used to do that stuff. And we don't do it anymore. And as a result, we have these, I don't think rapacious is too strong a word, food companies who will market junk food to the death because that's where they're making money, and they will market it to two-year-old kids. They'll market it to six-month-old kids. And you know, we've all seen, I don't know about in Chicago, but in New York, we have all seen people wheeling kids down the street in strollers, and the kids are, I don't know, eight, 10, 12 months old with iPads. And if those, and it's not an exaggeration, if those iPads have internet connection, the kid is watching, could well be watching a commercial for tricks or for Coke, or for anything like that. And there's, no regulation that can stop food marketers from doing that. And this is a matter of choice. I mean, we're trying to, we're talking about protecting children. Children are not rational. I mean, not that we're so rational, obviously, but children are not rational creatures. 
and you can train them to eat junk food. And every study, the slew of studies coming out now that say that by the time you're six months old, your food preferences are, are being established. And by the time you're six years old, it's kind of over. If wow. you're a person who drinks four sodas a day, you're going to have trouble not drinking four sodas a day. So it's a little off topic, I'm a little off the answer to your question, but these are public health issues, and we need, we need help protecting ourselves. Some people, I can say the spectrum thing too, and they'll say, oh yeah, I get it, and they'll go home and they'll eat more plants and they'll eat much less junk food and they'll be healthier people, but we know that not everybody hears things the same way, not everybody comes to talks like this, not everybody reads the New York Times, and we know that some people need more help than, just like when people stopped smoking, and you know, it's, it's not entirely a matter of class or income. When people started to stop smoking, some people had more trouble than others, and some people need smoking cessation classes, and some people need nicorettes, and some people need this, and some people need that, and people need help to change the way they eat. Not everybody can listen to a message and go act on it. This is what government is for, in my opinion. To protect the public health. <laughs> Do you think there's too much it's like politics? like a like-minded audience right. I'm getting this feeling. <laughs> Preach it to the choir. <laughs> Do you think? Uh, Do you think that it's it's the role of public policy to to decide what we eat and what is good for us and what is bad for us? Does this nation have enough public policy on food? No, we don't have any policy on food. I mean, our policy is de facto, and our policy is to support industrial agriculture, and everything else grows out of that. So if you're, you know, if you're asking how much can we determine how people eat, you know, we're, we're not looking for Joseph Stalin here, obviously, but there's a, there's a very broad um, spectrum, again, between doing nothing to encourage public health in food and and being fascists about it. So, you know, I think I, I think a soda tax is hardly a radical measure. I think perhaps saying a, a under 16 or under 14 year old kid can't buy soda without permission from their parent. I mean, perhaps warning labels on soda. I mean, these are tentative steps. Let's see how they work. Maybe that's enough. I doubt it, mm -hmm. but maybe that's enough. Or maybe to say you can't advertise junk food at all on channels that target children. Maybe that's enough. Mm -hmm. These are not harsh measures. They seem harsh because we are doing zero to rein in junk food marketing. And why but if it? we were doing four on a scale of one to 100, it would seem like a lot. And do you believe it's because of corporate interests or lobbyists that we're doing so little, or? Yeah, don't you? <laughs> 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 Um, okay, let's move well, on. Well, I also to believe that, you know, I, I believe we, um, uh, I, I, don't, I guess I don't want to get too political, but I guess I would, I would say that the Democratic administrations that we have had have been not as strong as they might have been during the course of my lifetime. I don't know why suddenly I'm becoming diplomatic, but there you go. <laughs> so, I'm in Barack Obama's hometown, so. Yeah, so let's move could have maybe <laughs> delivered more than it did. But let's get on to a more fun topic. Chicago just got a Shake Shack. Is it all that? God. <laughs> Do not be clapping about that. Look, I, um, <laughs> I'm all, I'm all in favor of higher quality meat. Um, because I, they do have meat I, raised I, without antibiotics. Right, that's really great. But you know, the first decision, the first decision you have to make is whether you're going to eat. You know that whole spectrum thing. The first decision you're going to like. I would rather people were eating non-organic apples than eating organic cheeseburgers, for example. You know, I don't, I don't think that the quality of meat turns what's essentially a fast food hamburger, fries, and shake operation into health food. It's better than McDonald's. It also costs two or three times as much as McDonald's, but it's still not good. And frankly, um, I'm, I was disappointed when Danny Meyer did this. Um, I know why I'm being diplomatic, because we're being <laughs> you gotta go back to Chicago, right. man. <laughs> you gotta go back to New York. Um, I was disappointed 
when Danny Meyer did this because I thought Danny Meyer is a very smart guy and a good person. And I thought he had an opportunity to launch into a healthy fast food thing. And instead he did maybe something that was a little more obvious and a little more obviously money making. So that's okay. It's great. You know, he's, it's going to be fine. And, but other people are taking up the, the banner of moving fast food towards more acceptable food. Chipotle. Well, Chipotle, Chipotle sort of showed the way. And um, there's plenty wrong with Chipotle. There's plenty right with Chipotle, but there's plenty wrong with Chipotle. And there are people who are going next step now. And none of them is a big name yet. And um, they're all vying to be in that position. But five years from now, we'll have established fast food chains everywhere where you can go and for reasonable, moderate amount of money, not, still not as cheap as what McDonald's can be, but a moderate amount of money, you can get tasty, decent food. And that'll be, that's a good thing. So being someone who writes about food policy and about food, you know it can be complicated. People get lots of different messages about what they should and shouldn't eat. What is your best source to tell the public about ways they can get good answers and try to understand it better? I think my job is to be that source, actually. So, so get a um, subscription to the Times. Well, I don't. <laughs> um, there, you know, I just read this David Foster Wallace thing about information, and it was, uh, you know, this book that he was writing before he died, before he died called The Pale King is about the IRS. So this sort of idea is that it's the most boring book ever written, but that was part of the point. Um, and there's this whole passage about information and how your job when you're presented with a lot of information is to discard all you can except for the best part. So that this is journalism, right? You take in way more than you can possibly handle and then you have to throw out everything that you judge to be not worth knowing mm -hmm. and keep what's left. So it's like that kind of, um, a, it's like a sculpture. You know, the, the statue is already in the block of marble. Your job is to get rid of all the stuff that's not the statue. Yeah. And the story is already there, but your job is to throw away all those words that somehow got into your head. And that, it's... That's what I do. And, I, you know, so I'm not the only person to read about food policy, but my job is to sort of take this stuff and try to make it easily digested, no pun intended. Um, and I get into fights with academics all the time because they say, well, you're misrepresenting us. And I say, I'm re representing you as best as I can, and if you could write half as well as I could, <laughs> you'd be representing yourself. It Sorry. Is, it is a challenge. I'm sure there's a few academics out here. Yeah. Some academics can write clearly. Um, so walk us through a day in the food life of Mark Bittman. There's no typical day. I've just been Make on the road. For, Make one I've up. just been on the road for um, 30 days. Tomorrow is 30 days. That's not typical. When you're in New York, when you control your food, what do you like to eat? I get up early. I have a banana. I go for a run. This is my made-up day, right? I get up early. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, what's that? The ideal It's mark. a, what do you call it? A, um, a composite. Amalgam composite. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I often have a banana first thing in the morning, coffee with milk. Um, I go for a run on a good day. I get to the office really early. I sit there with my feet up. I eat nuts and dried fruit during the course of the morning. I have much more coffee than I probably should. And then I have a struggle around lunch. Um, I work, I work. I mean, there is this work involved. Um, <laughs> I have this struggle around lunch, like what am I gonna do? Same as everybody else. And often I wind up going and getting um, a pile of greens, or I really like it if I can find a stir fry. If I'm home, I stir fry lunch. I like that. Um, or rice and beans. And then in the What's afternoon. What's your stir fry fat? Peanut oil? If That's I not? have it, it's okay. the best, but it's always like, oh, I ran out of peanut oil. I wind up using olive oil, okay. which is ridiculous, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then in the afternoon, I, I work at a slower pace because between two and four, I'm usually only semi conscious. <laughs> and sometimes if I'm home, I'll take a nap. And 
Then four, I usually get a second wind, and um, I work until seven, and then I go out to eat, and like I said, I eat whatever the hell I want. I don't cook, you know, it's funny, I used to, this is partly a result, I really am, I, there is no typical day, I really am traveling more than half the time, and um, my new joke is, I used to cook at home every night and make dates to go out, and now I go out every night and make dates to cook. So um, usually I'm cooking weekends at this point, or when I'm not traveling, or when I'm in the city of a, where I have a close friend, um, I might say, can I come over to your house and we'll cook together, and I do that. But um, it's become an increasingly rare pleasure. Yeah, it's sometimes those of us who write about cooking end up not cooking as much as we'd like to. Yeah. But speaking of cooking, and I know every cookbook writer hates it when I ask this, what are one or two of your favorite recipes in your new book? Okay, don't question. say okay, not favorite, not favorite. <laughs> what are ones you want to tell the audience that they've got to read in your new book? That has some really great tip or something. The chicken parmesan recipe is iconic. It really is. It's yeah. iconic. And fast. It's the best chicken parmesan you've ever eaten, and it's under 30 minutes, and it's really different. It's oh. iconic. For, you know, in that book, it's iconic. It's not world-class iconic. <laughs> in that book, it's iconic. So before we go to audience questions, and we would love questions, not comments, please, um, what's next for Mark Bittman? What is next for Mark? In a way, um, to answer that question personally is more than I'm willing to say. So professionally, I, what is professionally, next? Professionally, um, there will be more books. There's, an, there's a compendium of opinion columns coming out this spring. Nice. Um, I'm just putting finishing touches on that. I'm just starting a compendium of the wonderful eat columns that were in the magazine that many, many people are not aware of, so I have high hopes for that, because they're really fantastic. <laughs> and um, uh, there'll be another, there'll be some How to Cook Everything book down the road, and the opinion stuff, which takes a lot of time, will continue. I don't know that they'll, you know, I don't, I don't know that there'll be anything radically new or different in the near future. So we will still have the benefit of your food policy knowledge, I'm but not I'm not going to consider stop right. I'm going to write that column. Um, I, I actually won't commit past this, but I'm going to write that column for at least two more years. But I might not write it more than two more years. Because it's really, I'm finishing the third year. I'm entering the fourth year. Um, you know, that's wrong. <laughs> I might only write this column for one more year. I'm finished. Oh, I, I had a five-year commitment to both my closest editor and myself. Um, and January, I think the first column was February 1st, 2011. So January is going to be entering the fifth year. Um, and uh, it's, I, I mean, I, I was raving about how great it is, and it really, really is great, but it is very hard. And anyone who's had, way? well, first of all, it's <laughs> weekly deadlines are hard to be. And I've been on weekly deadlines since 84, I would say. I think I've had once, twice, or three weekly deadlines a week, every week since 1984. The Minimalist ran for 13 years. I never missed a week. So uh, that gets a little old. Mm -hmm. um, but also the, the, the food policy world is crowded in a much better way than it was when I started, in only four years. There are many more people doing it, and I think there are people doing it more nimbly, in interesting ways, very intelligently. I have my own style. I think it's fine, but I feel less like I'm essential than I did at the beginning. And maybe, maybe after five years it'll feel okay to stop. I don't know, because I do love it, but it's hard, and it also, um, I don't know. I might not even be the best person at it anymore. So for a while, I felt like I was really good at it. I don't know. It's, we'll see. I'm going to keep doing it, but maybe not for more than a year. Well, I hope you keep doing it for a while. And with that, I will throw questions out to the audience that they will bring a mic to you. And since we're recording this, we need you mic'd. 
Hi. Hi. I just I don't know if you have somebody in Chicago to cook with, but <laughs> happy to have you. But I wanted your opinion on what seems to be the topic du jour, which is about gluten and all the people going gluten free. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that question. I wish I had a better answer than I do. There's um, something mysterious is going on, I would say. There are people with celiac disease, and we've known that. There are people who will latch on to any trend that they can, and we know that. But there are people in between those who seem to be intolerant of something in wheat or in highly processed grains. So. Um, if you can digest farro, for example, and you can't digest wheat, what's going on there? And I don't know, here's what I do know. Seafood, dairy, nuts, and wheat are all things that have seen allergy rates skyrocket since you and I were young. Um, and those of us of a certain age remember going to school with peanut butter sandwiches and now Peanut butter is a lethal weapon. Something <laughs> has happened, and it's not satisfactorily explained anywhere. Gluten falls into that category. Aside from um, voting with our food dollars in the grocery store, what other things can we do as individual citizens to change the way that health policy is being done in this country? I think that your very asking of that question shows that many more people are doing just that and that those of us who bring the passion of improving the food system to our jobs can change our jobs by, by bringing that passion. Needless to say, we should be making food an issue for anyone who runs for public office, and we don't do that enough. People need to have a position on food. I mean, that's why we need a food policy, because we can say to candidates, are you supportive of this food policy? Because if you are, here's what that means. I think, generally speaking, parents should be working in schools. It's super important to have kids eating well in schools. It's super important for kids to be eating well at young ages. And everyone else who doesn't want to be working in schools should be working in maybe not quite the most micro part of their community possible. But I think we are going to see change most quickly at municipal and regional levels, and less quickly at state levels, and much more slowly at the federal level. So I think um, a sort of resurgence of involvement in municipal politics is really, really valuable. Uh, Mark, I was thrilled to hear you uh, talk about the good food movement in one of your columns recently. What's it going to take for the good food movement really to become uh, a true movement that has political clout and really can take us to the point where most of the food in America is good food? It's a great question, and I think one, you've hinted at one part of the answer, which is to, why would environmental groups not care about food? And why would environmental groups not care about agriculture? And why is the only way that most environmental groups can imagine to preserve land, to set it aside for little or no use, for conservancy, when the majority of land in this country, or a great deal of land in this country, is farmed. And it's a concern of how that land is treated. Those are environmental issues. So I think one thing is for people who care about food, who are already also environmentalists, who belong to the Sierra Club or Audubon or whatever, to push those organizations to start making more noise about food. That's one thing. The food movement, you know, I was, I'm doing this compendium, as I said, of opinion columns. and. The, and I used to say the nascent food movement. And I don't say the nascent food movement anymore. I say the food movement. And I think a turning point in the food movement was when so-called foodies made it clear that at least some of them supported the movement of fast food workers and tipped workers toward more just pay scales. And I think as we say, if you think of five years ago, there was really not a food movement. If you think now, and I agree with you, it's not as big as it needs to be, but if you think now, there is a food movement. And it's growing and it's small, but it's going to continue to grow, and um, we'll keep working towards that. I mean, there's no simple answer, obviously. We were talking about food stamps and how it's used with junk food, and I suppose that's because $10 will go a lot further on junk food than it will on 
good food. And I heard a, a comment on a television in a conversation about organic food versus non-organic food. And the answer to should we use organic food as opposed to not organic food was if you can afford it, yes. That statement just upset me because I'm, I mean, I mean, I think, I don't know what you think about no, that. No, no, that statement upsets me too, yeah. but it is, it's a true statement. So it is an upsetting true statement, but that is not only a food issue, that's a justice issue. It upsets you not because of food, it upsets you because it feels, I, I'm speaking for you, I'm sorry. I think it, it, it upsets me because it's a question of justice. And this is why working on food can be so mind expanding and so rewarding in a way because you get to a place where you say, well, I guess I'm gonna have, some people will say, I guess I'm gonna have to go work on better labor laws, or I guess I'm going to have to work on campaign finance because I want to see this changed. And as long as people are working 14 hours a day and taking mass transit to work and working unpredictable work schedules for $8 an hour, the question of whether those people can afford organic food or not is a very far afield question. Those kinds of people can barely afford to live. So that's not a, really an organic food question. That's a justice question. And yes, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed head on right now, totally agreed. Um, we're a long way from being able to say, should everybody be eating organic food? And I, you know, I will say that whole spectrum thing is first you throw away all the bad food, then you focus on plants, and then if you're obsessive enough or you can afford it, you can start to worry about how it's packaged, where it's from, whether it's organic, and so on. But that's not the key thing. The key thing is to throw away the junk food. Do you agree with the idea that uh, healthy food can be affordable? I, do, I did a piece three years ago, which I think is a really good piece about, I mean, I, I went out and shopped. I went out and ate in fast food restaurants. It's cheaper to cook than it is. You know, poor people cook. Really poor people cook because poor people don't have a choice because McDonald's is not, at, McDonald's is the cheapest, or Taco Bell is the cheapest fast food, but even cheap fast food is four or five dollars a serving. That's twenty dollars a meal for a family of four. So if you know how to cook, you can actually make. Even if you don't know how to cook, you may be forced <laughs> to cook if you don't have any money to buy prepared food. Next question. I find it quite disappointing that the health sector is very divorced from the food movement, and very shocking that actually your doctor so many years ago prescribed a vegan I'd diet. I said he was a good guy. Yeah, <laughs> really he was. What are your thoughts on getting the health sector on board in prescribing more, I don't know, organic methods of curing obesity versus, you know, medical well, invasive Well, we measures? don't have a health system that understands that prevention is easier than cure. And a lot of prevention of disease. You know, 50 years ago, more people died of communicable diseases than of chronic diseases. That's flipped. Now more people die of chronic diseases than communicable diseases. Chronic diseases are preventable. So I think that gradually healthcare, you know, with the Affordable Care Act and with insurance companies wising up, where there's going to be, just as there are discounts for people who wear seat belts for their car insurance and discounts for people who don't smoke for their health insurance or their life insurance, I think insurance companies will be pushing, pushing, pushing towards more um, preventative health care. I also think they'll start, they are increasingly teaching nutrition. It's not a really great word, but they're increasingly teaching nutrition in medical schools. I think that's changing. You're not, I mean, you're right. They shouldn't be divorced, but it, that is going to change. There are programs, Tulane's doing one, and um, I believe UFC and UIC are working on one of those to get it as part of the medical school curriculum. Well, sadly, that was the last question. Is that correct? Um, Mark Bittman, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.